We all know The Simpsons, right? Have you ever wondered if The Simpsons is just a video diary of real-life society? But beyond the satire, the chaos, and the dysfunctional family with their crazy adventures, the longest-running animated series in the world has a dark secret. For over three decades, this show has been celebrated for its otherworldly ability to predict future events with exact precision. From technological advancements to political outcomes or even events in the Bible, the long-running animated sitcom seems to have a knack for peering into the crystal ball of destiny. As we step into the year 2024, fans around the world are buzzing with anticipation, wondering what bizarre and unexpected events might unfold, especially the tumultuous events in Israel in general and Jerusalem in particular. So what do they have to say about the year 2024? Get ready to be amazed as we examine the most dangerous predictions the Simpsons have made for 2024 related to the holy city of Jerusalem. You will be even more shocked when you learn the truth that what this movie predicts strangely coincides with the events prophesied in the Bible and what is happening in this city. Trust me, this will be a wonderful journey into the fun yet thrilling world of the animated series, The Simpsons, mixed with the prophecies of the Bible. Join me on this adventure as we uncover terrible secrets about the year 2024. For many years, The Simpsons seem to have dropped predictions that have proven to be very accurate. But does The Simpsons even predict the future? Or maybe the writers and producers of The Simpsons are part of the elites who run our world. Cows, known as red heifers, now graze in a secret location in the West Bank for rebuilding the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and for bringing about the Dajjal. The origins of this scenario trace back nearly 2,000 years when the ancient Romans destroyed Jerusalem's last temple. The Book of Numbers states that a red heifer with no marks or imperfections is required for the temple's reconstruction. Jerusalem, in a speech marking the 100th day of the Gaza War, Hamas spokesman Abu Ubaidah made an unexpected statement. He accused Jews of bringing red cows to the Holy Land, linking them to the conflict in Israel. These cows, known as red heifers, now graze in a secret location in the West Bank. Some people believe they are important for rebuilding the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and for bringing about the Messiah. The origins of this scenario trace back nearly 2,000 years when the ancient Romans destroyed Jerusalem's last temple. The Book of Numbers states that a red heifer with no marks or imperfections is required for the temple's reconstruction. Yitzhak Mamo from Uvna, Jerusalem, played a pivotal role in bringing these cows to Israel. He explained that locating these special cows took years and led him to Christian ranchers in Texas. In a surprising turn, The Simpsons once aired an episode that seems oddly similar to the current situation with the red cows. The episode, named Apocalypse Cow, aired in 2008. Although not identical, it's fascinating to consider. Some speculate whether The Simpsons possess a talent for foreseeing events or if it's merely a chance. After all, the show has made some eerily accurate predictions in the past. Whether it's genuine foresight or simply clever storytelling, the idea of cows causing unexpected events resonates with what's happening now. While some people see these cows as pets, they are meant for a solemn purpose. They are to be slaughtered on an altar overlooking the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem as part of a temple rebuilding ceremony. However, the temple's location is now occupied by the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque, two important Islamic sites. Many Jewish activists want to reconstruct the temple, but this concept is controversial and might worsen regional tensions. At the same time, across the United States, certain evangelical Christians hold the belief that the red heifers symbolize the second coming of Christ. They see them as a symbol of Jesus' blood and eagerly await the temple's reconstruction. Even though there's a wish for peace, 
conflicts persist in the Middle East. Yitshak Mamo acknowledges the worries, but asserts that the cows aren't the reason for the violence. He stresses the importance of mutual understanding and peace among everyone. What is the significance of a red heifer in the Bible? It seems that every few years, a red heifer is born in Israel, and it results in some people thinking that the return of Jesus is near. Why is this? What does a red heifer have to do with the end times? Before we explore that question directly, it is important to understand the significance of a red heifer in the Bible. To meet the requirements of the Old Testament law, a red heifer was needed to help accomplish the purification of the Israelites from uncleanness. Specifically, the ashes of a red heifer were needed because red heifer ashes were necessary for the purification rites held at the temple, many have regarded the appearance of a red heifer today as heralding the construction of the third temple and the return of Christ. According to rabbinical tradition, there have been nine red heifers sacrificed since Moses' time. Since the destruction of the second temple, no red heifers have been slaughtered. The rabbi Maimonides taught that the tenth red heifer would be sacrificed by the Messiah himself. The Temple Institute, a group advocating the construction of a third temple, reports that five flawless red heifers from Texas arrived in Israel on September 15, 2022. Many people view this event as a fulfillment of prophecy, since the acquisition of a red heifer is a major step forward in plans for a new temple. The Mosaic Law specified that the red heifer was to be without defect or blemish, and to have never borne a yoke. The sacrifice of the red heifer was unique in the law in that it used a female animal. It was sacrificed away from the entrance to the tabernacle, and it was the only sacrifice in which the color of the animal was specified. The slaughtering of a red heifer is described in Numbers 19, 1 to 10. Eleazar the priest was to oversee the ritual outside the camp of the Israelites. After the animal was killed, Eleazar was to sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the tabernacle seven times. Then he left camp again and oversaw the burning of the carcass of the red heifer. As the red heifer burned, the priest was to add some cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet wool to the fire. The ashes of the red heifer were then collected and stored in a ceremonially clean place outside the camp. The ashes were used in the water of cleansing. It is for purification from sin. The law goes on to detail when and how the ashes of the red heifer were used in purifying those who came in contact with a dead body. Whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. They must purify themselves with the water on the third day and on the seventh day. Then they will be clean. Verses 11, 12. The purification process involved the ashes of the red heifer in this way. Put some ashes from the burned purification offering into a jar and pour fresh water over them. Then a man who is ceremonially clean is to take some hyssop, dip it in the water, and sprinkle. Anyone who has touched a human bone or a grave or anyone who has been killed or anyone who has died a natural death. The commands concerning the red heifer were yet another foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Christ for believers' sins. The Lord Jesus was without blemish, just as the red heifer was to be. As the heifer was sacrificed outside the camp, Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem. And just as the ashes of the red heifer cleansed people from the contamination of death, so the sacrifice of Christ saves us from the penalty and corruption of death. The red heifer ritual as established in the Mosaic Law was fairly simple. In the interval since that time, Judaism has added many standards and extra criteria. Talmudic tradition speaks of the type of rope the red heifer was to be bound with, the direction it was to face when being slaughtered, the words spoken by the priest, the wearing of sandals during the ritual, etc. The rabbinical rules listed many things that would disqualify a red heifer from being sacrificed. 
If she had been ridden or leaned on, if she had a garment placed over her, if a bird had rested on her, and if she had two black or white hairs, among many other conditions not found in the biblical text. According to the futurist timeline of eschatology, there will indeed be a third temple of God in Jerusalem. Jesus prophesied a desecration of the temple to occur during the tribulation. For that to happen, there obviously will need to be a temple. Assuming those who dedicate the end times temple follow Jewish law, they will need the ashes of a red heifer mixed with water for the ceremonial cleansing. If a blemish-free red heifer has truly been found and is in Israel, that could be one more piece falling into place for the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Must a red heifer be found before the rapture occurs? No, Jesus could return to receive his own at any moment. The rapture is not contingent on the presence of any particular cow. Must a red heifer be found before the temple is rebuilt? Not necessarily, although Temple advocates certainly want one for ceremonial purposes. Are animal sacrifices of any type required today? No. Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of the law, and his sacrifice provides true forgiveness and eternal life. Scripture explicitly contrasts the red heifer ceremony with the greater sacrifice of Christ. The ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Hebrews 9, 13, 14. As it happens, the Old Testament is full of references to cows and cattle. It is, after all, a history of an agricultural people. Many conversations that God had with Moses and his brother Aaron as they led the Jews through the desert toward the Promised Land. Speak unto the children of Israel, the Lord commanded, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. The cow will be given to a priest to slay, the Lord continued, and burned on a pyre of cedar hyssop and a strand of scarlet thread. Then the ashes of the heifer will be mixed with water and used to purify those who have been exposed to death. Anyone who fails to be purified shall be cut off from among the congregation because he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The Messiah will come again. His view of the end time is that Jesus' return will usher in a thousand years of peace and harmony. Before that, however, there will be seven years of tribulation. The Antichrist will appear, and the forces of good and evil will wage a cataclysmic struggle, culminating in Jesus' defeat of the false Messiah. Many evangelicals believe that Jews and other non-Christians will suffer for accepting the Antichrist as their Messiah that most of them will perish in the coming struggle, but those who survive will finally acknowledge Christ as their Savior. True Christians will be spared these catastrophes because they will have been raptured, snatched directly into heaven before the troubles begin. They will return to act as priests during Christ's millennial reign. At the end of that time, Satan will rally the forces of evil for a final confrontation with Jesus and the saints of the church at the Battle of Armageddon. The satanic warriors, led by a prince named Gog, will come from the north, from a land called Magog. God will destroy them, however. The dead will rise for their day of judgment, and a new Jerusalem will descend from the sky. Once again, God will dwell among his people. These prophecies require three great events before the Messiah can return, the nation of Israel must be restored, Jerusalem must be a Jewish city, and the temple, the center of worship and sacrifice in the ancient Jewish world, which was last destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, must be rebuilt. Two of these conditions have been met in the last 50 years. The second coming and the fate of humankind now depended on the red heifer. In order for the Jews to rebuild the temple and to prepare the way for the return of the Messiah, they must be purified with the ashes 
of a red heifer. According to the rabbis, the only way that Jews could become pure again was by being sprinkled with the ashes of a red heifer that has been mixed with water traditionally drawn from the pool of Siloam. According to the Mishnah, the written version of the oral tradition, the ceremony of the red heifer sacrifice has only been performed nine times in the history of the Jewish people. When the 10th heifer appears, the Messiah will finally come. After the war, the Israeli Minister for Religious Affairs, Zera Warhaftir, said that the Temple Mount had been the property of Israel ever since King David purchased the site from Arona, the Jebusite, in 1000 BC. But the Jews should not take any steps to reclaim it, because only the Messiah could build the Third Temple. This position was endorsed by many Jews, particularly the ultra-Orthodox, many of whom even opposed the establishment of the State of Israel. In their theology, the rebuilding of the nation, the gathering of Jews from exile, and the re-establishment of the Temple were all matters for the Messiah to handle. For mankind to undertake such things amounted to forcing the end. That was the work of Satan. There were many prominent Jews, however, who believed that they were already living in the end time. The recapture of Jerusalem was evidence enough, and that Jews must now do their part to prepare the way for the appearance of the Messiah. Soon after the Six-Day War was over, Shlomo Goren, who later became the chief rabbi of Israel, led a group of 50 followers onto the mount, where they fought off Muslim guards and Israeli police and conducted a prayer service. A week later, the chief rabbinate ordered that signs be placed in front of the gates saying that no Jews should set foot on the Temple Mount. The reasoning was that because Jews are ritually impure, they might accidentally step on the place where the Holy of Holies once stood. Such a desecration is punishable by death at the hand of God. This was supposed to put the Temple Mount theologically off limits, at least until the advent of the Red Heifer. For Christians, building the temple is important only in that it raises the curtain on the apocalypse. Richmond explains that the temple is critical to Jews. We have this concept that we have 613 commandments to fulfill, and one-third of those commandments are dependent in some way on the temple for their fulfillment. Many of these temple laws involve the sacrifice of animals. For Jews in the ancient world, animal sacrifice was a means of achieving the purity that was essential in relating to God. A person can be defiled by even indirect contact with death, for instance, through the ground itself, which harbors the dead. Therefore, no one who walks on the ground is sufficiently holy to enter the temple precincts. So the absence of a red heifer made the rebuilding of the temple a moot point for Orthodox Jews and therefore for Christians as well. For as long as there have been archaeologists, there has been a hunger to excavate the mount in order to establish the exact location of the first temple and also to find some of the treasures it is supposed to harbor. The subsurface of the mountain is interlaced with tunnels and cisterns and legendary secret chambers which may hide the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets of the Ten Commandments which have been lost since the destruction of the first temple. On several occasions, archaeologists and Jewish religious leaders have conducted unauthorized digs under the mount, which have been met with outraged responses on the part of Islamic authorities. Because no one can say definitively where on the mount the temple stood, most observant Jews have obeyed the rabbinical proscription against going onto the mount. However, it is well known that Herod built up the periphery of the mount when he enlarged the temple. And for that reason, it is thought by many Jews to be safe to walk on. Jerusalem makes a cult of holiness, one that fuels the passion and yearning of millions for a personal encounter with God. In the Old Testament, time and time again, it says, this is God's house. This is where God dwells. The assumption was that God's power and protection were most efficacious in this place. Hence, the importance of pilgrimage to Jerusalem, pilgrimage to the temple. 
For centuries, believers have streamed into the city in order to bathe in the sense of divinity and to marvel at the sight that all three religions believe will be the place of the last judgment. On that day, both evangelical Christians and Orthodox Jews expect their Messiah to stride down from the Mount of Olives and burst through the Golden Gate. Many Muslims believe that the Kaaba, the holiest place in Mecca, will be transported to Jerusalem and that all the dead will meet again in the streets of the city. As long as such mythologies are taken literally, the struggle for Jerusalem and the Temple Mount will never end. The religious carnage that has marked every era of this maddened city will continue because whoever controls Jerusalem controls access to the sacred places. It is a way of owning God. For Christian believers, the significance of the red heifer is not that it is used to ceremoniously purify priests outside of the Holy of Holies. The red heifers are significant when it comes to eschatology or the study of the end times as described in the Bible. The red heifers relate especially to the end times element of the third temple being built on the Temple Mount. When the temple is rebuilt, one of the necessary pieces is the ashes taken from a pure red heifer. Just as Numbers 19 indicates, the red heifer needed for the purification ceremony must be without spot or blemish, and some of today's red heifers fit into this category. This is the statute of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Tell the children of Israel that they will bring you a healthy red heifer which has no blemish, and on which a yoke has never gone, and you will give it to Eleazar the priest, and he will bring it outside the camp, and it will be slaughtered before him. Num 19.2.3 The other parts of this purification ceremony involve the taking of the ashes themselves and placing them in a clean place. A man who is clean will gather the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place, and it will be guarded for the assembly of the children of Israel for water purification. It is for purifying from sin. While this ceremony is not what we as Christians need to make us pure before the Lord as it is His blood that has atoned for our sins, we can look at them today as a sign of what is still to come before Christ's return. Having a pure of age, red heifer is an indicator for Christians that these days are fast approaching. While the blood of a cow cannot atone for our sins, by understanding Jewish purification ceremonies in light of what Jesus said about the end times, we can see our current day and age from an entirely new perspective. One of the predictions that can be fulfilled in 2024 is that a big war will happen. A pre-mainstream series episode from The Simpsons. Tracy Ullman Shorts, entitled World War III, sees Homer pranking his family with WW3 scares. He wakes up the family in the middle of the night, claiming that World War III has started in order to test their, and in effect, the world's readiness for a nuclear war. Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel has sparked fears that the Middle East could soon be plunged into a wider war. Tehran's decision to fire 300 drones and missiles at its long-standing foe. The first time Iran has attacked the country directly has posed questions over whether major powers could be dragged into World War III. For the moment, world leaders and international bodies are urging restraint, with little appetite for a conflict that could spiral out of control. However, experts do expect Israel to retaliate. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu convened his five-member war cabinet to discuss the next steps, reporting that the majority of the cabinet favors an Israeli response of some kind, but that members are split on the scale and timing of one. So what will Israel do next? How might other countries respond should violence escalate? Israel could opt for limited, targeted strikes in response. Defense experts said the most likely targets would be the bases from which Iran launched its attack. But the U.S. expert wrote on the think tank's website 
that he expected the response to be specific and contained and won't lead to another significant Iranian response. The severity of Israel's possible retaliation will depend on the scale of suffering. It appears the interception of almost all 300 drones and missiles launched by Iran prevented too much damage. Minor damage was caused to an Israeli airbase. Medics reportedly said a seven-year-old girl was seriously wounded in the south of the country, apparently in a missile strike. Israeli defense chiefs said 99% of the drones and missiles were brought down. However, Iran could still launch more strikes. This campaign is not over yet. Israel could decide to go further and bomb a wider series of Iranian military bases, sites used by Iran's Revolutionary Guards Corps, and even government buildings. Some have warned that Mr. Netanyahu could opt to hit the enemy's energy and nuclear infrastructure. If Israel were to inflict significant casualties in any strikes, it may be difficult to avoid an escalatory cycle of violence. The expert wrote that some inside Israel will want to retaliate in kind on Iranian soil, potentially targeting critical military, energy, and nuclear installations. He added, should this line of reasoning prevail, a catastrophic war would become nearly unavoidable. If Iran and Israel do engage in further strikes on each other, it may be difficult to prevent other actors in the region from getting involved in a wider war. Tehran has typically used proxies such as Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Houthis in Yemen to target Israel and its allies. Should either of the militant groups join the fighting, escalation may become hard to stop. The US and UK are, to some extent, already involved. Jordan also sent jets to down Iran's drones over its airspace. If confirmed, it could well inflame tensions with regional neighbor Iran. Saudi Arabia also finds itself in a difficult position. The regional Sunni power, which has condemned Israel's bombardment of Gaza, has long-standing antagonism with largely Shia Iran, having engaged in its own conflict with the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen since 2015. The worst case scenario would see Iran's allies Syria and Iraq also drawn into a wider conflict. World powers could help stop a wider conflict. The UN, the US, the UK, and other European leaders want to avoid war. Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Qatar, and others have warned Israel and Iran against escalation. China and Russia have joined them in urging restraint. There is also reason to believe that Iran is not planning any further strikes. Hitting only a small number of targets in Israel may be a welcome outcome in its bid to send a message to Tel Aviv. Iran had vowed revenge ever since an airstrike on the Iranian Damascus consulate in Syria on the 1st of April. It holds Israel responsible, though Israel has not accepted this. The strong desire to avoid a wider war could see Iran and Israel decide to draw a line under direct hostilities for now. But tensions will remain high for the foreseeable future, and it is never easy to keep a lid on violence once it erupts. The reign of the glorious kingdom of God on earth will produce beauty and productivity the world has never known. We can get a glimpse of God's greatness and a foretaste of tomorrow's world in the creation around us. God has blessed the earth with awesome, majestic mountains, verdant valleys, and productive plains. We marvel at pristine lakes and churning oceans. We appreciate the variety of flowers, plant life, birds, animals, and sea life. In tomorrow's world, the very nature of animals will change. God created human beings for a wonderful purpose, to be a part of his divine family for all eternity. He created us in his own image, and he gave human beings the power, the freedom, to choose between good and evil. Relatively few in the history of man have found the way to life so freely offered by God through his Son, Jesus Christ. Mankind has generally gone its own way, experimenting with every form of government, religion, 
philosophy, education, entertainment, science, technology, business, and commerce. Where will it all lead? To World War III. Will this conflict change the world situation? Will World War III break out? Faced with this tense situation, we can only pray. We are living in the end times, and any prophecy found in the Bible can come true. Be alert and careful. Read the Bible and be prepared to face any event that will appear in the near future. God bless you. As we step into the new unpredictable year of 2024, the world of The Simpsons appears to be a microcosm of our world today. It leads us to wonder if the show's creators possess a genuine crystal ball or just a strange ability to possess an all-seeing eye. While these striking resemblances to real life are portrayed in good fun, there's an undeniable allure to the notion that a cartoon about a dysfunctional family in a fictional town might hold the keys to unlocking the mysteries of the years to come. So we are living in the world of 2024. Let's keep an eye out for any signs that prove that The Simpsons might be once again pulling back the curtain on the events that await us in the not so distant future. Well, that's all about today's video. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you in the next videos. Goodbye.